Yes, you absolutely can make your dough knead itself, at least part of the way. Watch, I'll just mix some water into some bread flour, just about as much as it seems like the flour wants to absorb without any real kneading. And then if I pick that up and stretch it out, you can see it's not ready to be bread yet. It is brittle. It's not smooth or elastic yet. Normally, I'd remedy this situation by kneading, maybe 10 or 15 minutes of hard kneading for something chewy like pizza dough. But lately, I've been doing this instead. Just put the dough down, cover it up, go do something else with your life. And here we are just 20 minutes later. Looks about the same, but if I pick it up and stretch it, what a difference, right? And if I just knead it a little bit up in the air, super sloppy, quick kneading, look at what I got. I've got a window pane. The window pane test is this classic benchmark that baking instructors teach beginning students. They tell you to knead your dough until you can stretch it out into a membrane so smooth and thin that you can see light through it. This means your dough will be easy to shape, it'll be sufficiently plastic to inflate into bubbles in the bread, but it'll also be elastic enough that those bubbles won't immediately pop. They'll set into a fluffy yet chewy bread. If your dough tears before you can and get it this smooth, you've got more kneading to do. I've hardly done any kneading at all, and I'm already there because my dough kneaded itself at least part of the way. I can see my window pane through my window pane. I would bet you all of my bread that this self-kneading property of dough has been known, at least in some form, to bakers since baking began. But because a professor at the French National School of Milling and Cereal Industries gave this self-kneading phase a fancy scientific name, we now use that name and we attribute the technique to that guy, Professor Raymond Calvell, seen here in a video published by the Culinary Institute of America in 1994. And that fancy scientific name he bestowed upon it? Autolice. Or autolice would be the French pronunciation. I think that sounds like something you would get at a car dealership. I say autolice because that's a little bit closer to the scientific Greek roots, which would be autolysis, and we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, the mytho-historical origin story of the autolice goes like this. The French have an insanely strong tradition of home bread baking. And so, lots of French households had electric mixers by the early 1970s. Calvell believed these mixers were leading to an epidemic of overneeded baguettes. Mon Dieu! See, when you knead dough by hand, it's almost impossible to overneed it. More is generally better. So, when people got electric mixers, they naturally first applied the more is more philosophy and just kneaded it a ton on the mixer. Calvell observed that kneading in a machine like this will simply stretch and turn the dough way more times than you will with your hands. This exposes more of the dough to air, leading to oxidation of the flour. Flour is intentionally oxidized by millers. They've been doing that for centuries. They used to do it through aging or maturing the flour for a few weeks. And then over the last century or so, they've turned more and more to chemical oxidizing agents. Oxidation changes the carotenoid pigments in the flour so that it will appear white instead of yellow. Consumers manifestly prefer white. Oxidation also enhances gluten formation, making it easier to knead a stretchy dough. Again, these are generally regarded as desirable traits, but too much of anything is not good for you, baby, or that is what Calvell argued. He said that mixing machines were resulting in over-kneaded French breads, French breads that were too oxidized, too white, too chewy, too dense. So Calvell evangelized the auto lice. He said, just let your flour soak in water for a bit, and then you will not need to knead it for so darn long, thus exposing it to air. I think I resisted autolyzing my dough for a long time because I thought the name was pretentious and I doubted many of the claims people make about how it improves the flavor and the texture of breads. We'll scrutinize those claims in a moment. But for what it's worth, I'm fully convinced that autolyzing saves on labor, especially if you don't have an expensive stand mixer. It's a great thing for normal home cooks living in the real world. Almost as great as the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Let me thank them real quick. Winter is here, I've had some sniffles lately, and because HelloFresh recipes are seasonal, man, they sent me exactly what I needed. Give me that soup. Especially with the holidays upon me, I just really appreciate having somebody else do the grocery shopping a few nights a week. All of these meals are perfectly pre-portioned, so there's almost no food waste, which is more sustainable. And man, I just love getting to follow somebody else's directions from time to time. They boil every recipe down to like six steps. They make very clever use of things like these concentrated 
concentrated stock packets. In half an hour, I've got an Italian wedding soup full of fresh vegetables and protein that tastes like my grandma cooked it all day. You can sign up for meatless plans too, calorie smart. There's holiday add-ons you can get like cheese boards, snowman cookies. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code AdamRagusia14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Link is in the description, AdamRagusia14 for 14 free meals. Thank you, HelloFresh. Now, before we talk about what the autolyse actually is and how to best do it, we need to remind ourselves what gluten is. Okay, so the gluten um, is a is protein with water bonded to it. That is Emily Bueller, author of the excellent book, Bread Science, link in the description. I was a chemistry major and I went through grad school, but then I took a break from school just not knowing what I wanted to do next. And I got a job in a bread bakery. And as soon as I was there, I immediately realized there was a lot of chemistry going on in the dough. Hence the book. So anyways, gluten happens when glutenin and gliadin proteins in wheat mix with water and they create this kind of sticky, stretchy web. A protein chain can form bonds with itself um, or it can form bonds with water molecules. And when you add the water to your flour, it kind of sets everything in motion and enables everything to move around and all different kinds of bonds start forming. So there are those strong disulfide bonds and those are between the protein chain and another section of the protein chain. And then there are hydrogen bonds. It's like an atom with um, a lot more electrons and then a hydrogen atom, which only has one electron, there's kind of an attraction between them. And then there are ionic bonds, which would be an amino acid group that has maybe a positive charge on it. And then if there's a negative charge floating around somewhere, they form a bond. So all these different kinds of bonds form, but it's kind of random, just like whoever happens to be near whoever else can, can bond. So as you're kneading, you're rearranging everything and maybe there's a weak bond and you, you know your pressure on the dough breaks it, but then you have two groups that are free and they're able to form a better bond. So as you need, you're breaking weaker bonds, enabling more strong bonds to form. So there you go. That's what kneading dough is basically all about. Also, by folding the dough over on itself, we scramble all of those bonded bits into a tangled network that gives you a shirt instead of a random heap of thread. The shirt represents the fully kneaded assembled dough. But before any of that can happen, you have to unwind the bobbins of thread. The bobbins in my metaphor here are protein granules. This old paper, 1985, has some of the best publicly available photos of the inside of wheat and dough that I've seen. At extremely high magnification, these big dark circles are protein granules. The proteins are all bunched up and bonded to themselves and each other. The protein granules have to be unraveled so that they can mix with water and then tangle back up with each other in this kind of nice, wet, sticky mesh. How do you unravel the granule? Well, you hit it with protease enzymes that are already present naturally in the flour. You just have to activate them with water. These enzymes catalyze a reaction that breaks the internal bonds within the protein granules. They fall apart into individual proteins, and then those fall apart into peptides that make up the proteins, and then the peptides fall apart into the amino acids that make up the peptides. And this is the autolease that Raymond Calvell was talking about. Look at the Greek roots. Auto means self. Lysis means disintegrate or fall apart, separate. So what does it mean? It means self-destruct, autolysis, self-disintegrate. We wet the proteins, they pull themselves apart, and when they're in little bits and pieces like that, they have all of these bonding sites available so we can tangle them up together with water and starch. Starch is the main component of flour. This is an even older paper, 1973, an oldie but a goodie, cited by Bueller in her book. And here we have a single flour particle wetted with a drop of water. Those circles are starch granules swelling up with water. The fibrils between them are gluten, proteins that have broken apart, linked up with water, and formed a mesh. Once the proteins have exploded like that, all we have to do is push them around a little bit to force them into a nice shirt of gluten. Kneading autolyzed proteins is like this. Kneading intact protein granules is like this. 
We're gonna get a shirt much faster doing this. Autolyze dough is actually so easy to knead that with a very, very wet dough, it literally fully kneads itself. You don't have to touch it. This is what happens in so-called no knead recipes. The agitation caused by fermentation and other reactions going on in there, that is enough to move things around inside a very wet dough and knead it without any physical kneading from you. But no knead recipes have their own hassles. They're super sticky and kind of hard to work with. A less wet recipe that you allow to fully autolyze before you knead it, well, you might call that a semi-knead dough or a semi-no-knead dough, and that's been my jam lately. How long does the autolyze take? Bakers will tell you anywhere between 15 minutes and an hour. I'm sure it depends on the exact dough composition and maybe some environmental factors. I've gone with an hour in the past, but in all of the experiments I did for this video, 20 minutes seemed to be enough. I got all of the benefits after 20 minutes. I'm going with 20 minutes from now on. The bigger question is which ingredients ingredients should be present for the auto lice. Most recipes tell you to leave the salt out for this phase. As Emily Bueller here explains, salt can mess with the ionic bonds inside the dough. So gluten just as a molecule has a slight positive charge. And so if you think of this long chain and it has little positive charges all along it, when it's just by itself, it kind of wants to unravel because it wants to separate those positive charges. So when you add the salt, the salt dissolves into positive and negative ions, and the negative ions are able to shield the positives on the gluten, and that enables it to contract into more of a ball shape and less of a stretched out chain. So in theory, the salt gets you a less effective autolyse. But in my little experiment here, I did not notice a huge difference. By the way, you might be very confused right now if you've always heard that salt strengthens gluten. It does, but in the very beginning stages of mixing a dough, you don't want the protein to be strong. You want it to fall apart. And then you want to form it into the shape that you want to have it in, the dough, and then you want it to firm up again so that it'll be stable and it won't rip. That's what the salt does. Yeah, so I guess for maximal efficiency, knead in the salt after the auto lice. Here you can see me kneading in the salt and some barley syrup and the yeast. All of that I did after I just let the flour and the water sit by themselves for a while. And what about yeast? Calvell's original auto lice method just calls for flour and water. No yeast, not yet. One concern with yeast at the auto lice stage is that fermentation creates acid. It lowers the pH. More acidic conditions cause proteins to kind of flop out. Which actually you want in an auto lice, right? But too floppy can be bad. Check out what happens if I mix flour with white vinegar. Let that sit for 20 minutes and that just falls apart. This is also what happens if you try to make Indian style breads with too much yogurt in them, I have found. But that's a real extreme comparison. Yeast do not make that much acid, at least not in the first 20 minutes when dried yeast is just waking up. In my little experiment here, I bloomed my dry yeast in the dough during the autolyse. I combined those two steps. Emily Bueller does the same thing. And I noticed no difference in the elasticity of the dough. The autolyse seemed to be just as effective with the yeast in there. Now look, I'm not at all sure how these variables might affect the finished bread. There's so many other variables down the road that would depend on what kind of bread you're making and who knows. What I know for sure is that this pre-soak, this autolyse saves a lot on work. And the effect is there whether you just mix the flour in the water and let that soak for a while by itself, or if you mix up the whole darn dough recipe and just let it, that sit there for a while. Either way, mix it up. Make sure that you've gotten everything wet. You don't want any dry patches. That's kind of the one trick with the autolyse. If you have dry patches like that, those could be a little bit difficult to kind of knead out later, but mix it up, whatever it is, just leave it there for 15, 20 minutes, walk away, come back. You're gonna have a much easier time of it. But does the autolyse also improve flavor and texture? I'm sure industrial bakeries have their own proprietary research on the topic. The most systemic exploration of that question you will find on the internet is this excellent blog post by Barb Alpern at King Arthur Flour. It's linked in the description. She tested all kinds of different autolyse procedures to see if they affected color and flavor and texture. And her conclusion, if I may paraphrase, is meh. But she still agrees that the dough is way easier to work if you just mix it up beforehand, let it sit for a while, and then come back and finish your kneading. And that, for me, is reason enough to do it. You do you.